Each one require, yeah, well, the only way I can do it, each one gets its own camera. But Facebook is the only one where we are likely to get viewers. Although, you now is a possibility. I've, I've gotten viewers on you now before. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, it's going to be so surreal. Oh, what gives me, I think I forgot, is a water bottle. You get a yeah, let's get some. That's a good idea. recording or that's broadcasting that's broadcasting that's broadcasting and that is just recording in case any of these broadcasts don't actually record mm. the video <sighs> so here we are <laughs> all right all right um all right i guess i'll start it and we should really only go an hour because i have to go to seattle tonight so hello um uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, you now, and Sherry Jones, Sandy Herschelman, and uh, we have two viewers on Facebook already. All right. Facebook really picks up the viewers. Um, so welcome to the fifth. Fourth, I think it's the fifth episode of the Mindful Activist. My name is Matt Reddy. Oh, that one dropped out. My name is Matt Reddy, and I am the host of this podcast. I am an activist. Um, what do I say? I'm the founder of the Global Consensus Project, the developer of the Hive1.net software, and I'm also an elected politician, a hospital commissioner here in Jefferson County, uh, Washington. And uh, this is this is my podcast. And joining me today is Alex Bryan. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm really excited about having Alex here today. Um, very interesting fella and uh, we've had some interesting, uh, we've worked together in interesting ways and interesting projects which we'll get into. Um, and for those of you watching on Facebook, uh, we're not going to pay a lot of attention to the comments as we're talking, um, but we will check in with them periodically. Um, let's see, and the other thing that I often do, which is like, uh, is I start a, a live video conference that anyone could join. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna do that right now before we keep talking and then I'm gonna try to stop paying attention to the technology all around me. <laughs> I'm impressed with your handle on it all. <laughs> so, so we're using the Zoom software for this video conference and technically um, any number of people could join up to actually 50 people could join um, using this free uh, account with them and I'm just gonna go on Facebook and post the link and we'll call it good no one will probably join the uh, conference the conference although we've had a couple drop-ins before um, and uh, my friend Kim did join uh, for a few minutes once, but eventually, and when they conference, so we're gonna like we'll be able to show them right here. So we'd have like oh, oh I see a bunch I see. of people like right there behind us. 
There we are. I see we're live on Facebook. Right. And uh, pasting the link. Okay. Posted the link on Facebook. So now we'll we'll begin an interview. Uh, so welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Uh, except I just bumped my head on the way over here on a tree, cutting through the woods to get to the bus stop. So uh, yeah, yeah, but. I'm okay. Has it altered your state of consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking. So, uh, why don't we begin with my, my one question that I ask everyone, which is, uh, do you consider yourself an activist? Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's right. I remember that question from watching your podcast last week, yeah. and I thought about that. Um, well, I guess... I would say yes and no, uh, in the sense that uh, yes, I, I I definitely prefer action over over philosophy and intention, um, uh, and and I'm taking action uh, on various fronts, but it raises the issue of uh, is there such a thing as an activist or or a professional or a teacher or you know these labels that we use to describe ourselves. Or other people. Um, Trump is a fascist. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we could go on and on, but um, the the labeling is actually part of, is very much at the uh, a big part of the work that I do is looking at uh, labeling and uh, what I would call evaluations, other forms of evaluation, as being very much at the root of conflict and violence. So that's the part so, where I would say no. Ah, uh, so. Labeling itself, you're saying, is at the root of conflict and violence, or or just a contributor potentially to. Uh, well, we're, we're going to break right into this here, I guess. Um, uh, right. Well, without actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, we're not giving. That's interesting because we're not giving people any context right. for who you are. Right. We just jumped right into. Yeah. Uh, Would you like me to introduce myself? Why don't we? Well, all right, we'll stop. You, we're going to pick up back on labels because you're right. This is a rich. Topic. I've thought about it a lot. So why don't we, why don't we do that? Give some, give a little bit of context. Who the heck are you? How would you like to introduce yourself to our vast audience? Yeah. Thanks. Um, <laughs> well, uh, my name is Alex Bryan, and I've lived here since 2001. And about 10 years ago, I started a, a business that morphed into a nonprofit uh, called Third Ear Project. Third Ear, as in listening. Um, and that was based on work that I was doing with uh, what I called at the time compassionate communication or intentional communication. All of it's rooted in Marshall Rosenberg's work uh, of nonviolent communication. Uh, but in the process of doing this, I came to realize that really this is not about communication per se. It's much more about an awareness and a practice. Uh, so. I've been working on sort of reformulating it out of the communication context and more into the context of the of preventing conflict and violence, which is another way of saying making peace. So, it, so, what type of um, situations would you would this project get involved? Are we talking corporations, uh, government, communities? Um, what type of situation? Yeah, all. Uh, all Really, all of the above and more. Um, I, I see government. I don't know if I worked with government yet, but uh, you know, I've worked in schools and families and businesses, and I've worked in prisons and church groups mm -hmm. and uh, just anywhere where there are people dealing with. Well, I wasn't going to say with each other, but dealing with themselves, even uh, how we relate to ourselves and each other. Um, uh, so it's it's anywhere that people are are navigating navigating reality, navigating life, going through life, going through relationships, going through decision-making processes, uh, all those places where we encounter differences with each other that need to be navigated or figured out in some way. Um, a lot of people talk about conflict and they'll say conflict is inevitable. You know, it's human nature, it's, it's inevitable. And I, and, and I, much of this work is about being very clear about definitions of words and using them very consistently because that's part of, I think that's part of the problem is the very um, loose use that we have with very with this, these concepts. I think there needs to be more of a science of peace, a science of conflict and violence prevention. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. Where was yeah. I? Um, well, I mean, you're like triggering like like 
several branches of questioning. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so just to finish my yeah. introduction, I just I, I stopped doing Third Ear Project here in Port Townsend about four years ago, and I've been traveling a, a good bit and working on a book and a website, and that's what I've got going now is uh, my new website that I'm putting up my training on videos and stuff like that. So I'm trying to do just ex expand my reach. Okay. Uh, on the internet, so that's and what's your website address? Do you have that yet? I, I do, but it's not quite. Uh, uh, it's not quite ready for prime time. Yeah, you know, but you know, if you uh, if you say it out loud on this podcast, you're going to feel so motivated when you go home today <laughs> to, <laughs> to get it, it to get it at least like the front page yeah, ready to yeah, go. Yeah. It'll it'll motivate you. Trust yeah, me, I've right done right this to myself. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I will do that on next week's podcast. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> it it is live. You you could go there, but I just want to hold off a little bit longer till sure. it's till it's. Uh, ready for prime time. I know what you mean, but I've been basically using that technique to force myself to like yeah. get this podcast going, get my website going, just like tell someone about it. Uh, anyways, I've thought about that with my book because I see that people do uh, uh, Kickstarter campaigns and stuff in order to write their book, and they get the funding before they've written the book. And I've been writing a book for the last few years, and so it's like <laughs> that would be immense pressure to get yeah. have expectation and pay up front. But anyway, so. There we go. All right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but I think it might help um, anyone watching this to have uh, to tell them a little bit of a story, a narrative that they can follow. So why don't we um, why don't we tell a little bit of our narrative of how we ended up uh, knowing each other, if that's all right with you? Oh yeah, sure. So, um, do you, would you like to? I, I, why don't you just tell from your perspective? I, could. Um, I mean, my memory is that we met at Occupy. Do you, do you remember what, like, what event uh, we started working together? And not really. It's been a few years, yeah. and uh, I remember. I think I remember a meeting in in the Undertown that you mm -hmm. were there. Yeah, a few meetings there, um, and then the gathering in Portland. There was an Occupy. Northwest or some some larger trying to stitch together a larger thing I think down in Portland uh, that we went to. I, I, there was the Occupy Olympia. Maybe it was, uh, no, was it Olympia? Olympia. Yeah, you're the, right. You're right. Not Portland. Solid social oh. forum. Occupy yeah, Olympia yeah, social yeah, forum. Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, I remember it a little bit more detailed than that. So I'll excellent, tell my story. <laughs> so yeah. it um, and I told this story because I interviewed yesterday or the day before. Um, another person that helped start Occupy Port Townsend, Barbara Mori. But it was um, a, a group uh, decided to try to start an Occupy Port Townsend General Assembly and um, scheduled a meeting in the, the Undertown, which existed at that time. And um, either, either the first or second meeting, you were there and um, you immediately uh, shared um, that you had facilitation uh, skills and expertise and immediately started like helping um, those of us that were really trying to figure out how are we going to facilitate. I do remember now sitting at the end of a very long table. Yeah. 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 And it ended up, uh, I think after that first meeting, you and I ended up uh, exchanging phone numbers and we ended up on the phone a lot right, talking right. about like, what do we do? Because we had like a series of planning meetings. Yes. And... Um, we basically, I mean, we really co-created the process that we were going to use for that first Port Townsend, Occupy Port Townsend General Assembly, yep. and then we co-facilitated that uh, General Assembly. Where was that? That was at the UU, right. at the Unitarian right, right, right. Fellowship. Right, of course. And yeah. actually, the whole thing is on video. Oh, right on. And um, so you, you can actually, those of you that are really interested, you can see Alex and me facilitate the first Occupy Port Townsend nice to General that. Assembly. Archived, cool. Yeah. Um, and so that was a really, that was an interesting experience. I mean, that was for me, that was like, I really started to learn how, um, well, learn the difference between facilitation and facilitation with an eye for, uh, really being egalitarian, mm -hmm. really facilitation with the lowest amount of power, um, differential that you can possibly have. Um, and still have really effective uh, group process. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that image, that phrase. Yeah, yeah. lowest power differential. Yeah, and okay. is is that um, now? Did you come into that? You, you came. What were your skills coming into that? What was the background? Because for me, it was it was workshop facilitation from um, the hospital where I worked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was um, what was your 
Where'd you come from? Yeah, at, at the time I was busy studying and learning and teaching dynamic governance, also known as sociocracy. Okay. Uh, and so I was working with the Fort Warden Partners group at that time mm -hmm. and, uh, and other groups, uh, Goddard College and uh, some other groups, uh, helping them to implement consent decision-making processes. And those and those uh, um, more egalitarian meeting facilitation processes, and so that's what I was doing. And when I saw Active Happy, I was like, "Oh wow, that looks like it. there's probably a need there for some help with group yeah. decision making and you know yeah. that kind of thing." So and then um, and then you took off. You uh, the Occupy Fort Townsend sort of carried on for about a a year, and then but you I I remember you telling me you went and visited other Occupy. Uh, groups. Did you do that? Yeah, I went to Portland um, because I had a friend down there that was very involved with Portland Occupy. Okay. And uh, I went down there and also to Seattle, uh, although they seemed less interested in any sort of, uh, well, same with Portland. Both places were relatively, generally seemed uninterested in a formal pre packaged system for. Facilitate, you know, for decision making or whatever. So. so you went there. You wanted to share some of your ideas. You were hoping. I was curious yeah. uh, what, what was going on. I wanted to participate. I totally loved the movement, um, and so I was going anyway. But I was sort of exploring to see if there was something I could offer or a way to a way to support what was happening with what I knew. And so, what? How did that? Um, how did that stop? Like, what was? What happened? Um, well, uh, let's see how that stop. Um, I, I mean, I went to some of those, and then in the, and then not long. Let's see. I actually wanted to go to uh, Zuccotti Park, um, and then things got shut down by the time I could mobilize away from the West Coast. Yeah, uh, that was winding down, mm -hmm. and then I went to the East Coast anyway, and ended up in Florida. And I, well, how, do you remember what year that was? Was that four years ago? Uh, I think it might have been. Maybe more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I'm trying to remember what what I did that winter. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, mean, I was traveling on the East Coast. Yeah, and then eventually you came back, and and now you are, um, and so now you're sort of focused on uh, helping people with conflict, with um, a healthy process. Yeah, I, I am working with some people. I do some coaching and I've done some classes on the phone. Uh, mostly I've been focused on trying to uh, sort of organize all the information uh, that I'm trying to put out there and figure out the best platform for doing that. Uh, so uh, mostly, yeah, working on how to scale it up and make it available to a lot more people. Because the basics of it, is, it was, I was thinking about my classes and I, and I realized when I thought about it, most people on a class are spend most of the time during class listening. So, so of course, on a live class, you always have the, the, the option in real time to raise your hand or ask questions or uh, bring up your own stuff and work work with that. Uh, but most of it, most of the learning happens just from listening to people bring their stuff up and people work through it and me facilitate that and other people in the group work with them. Uh, so. So there's a lot of learning that can be done just by listening, and I started realizing then that means that if I record, you know, or do videos of just me explaining a lot of this stuff, that's a way to get it out there a lot more efficiently. Yeah. So it still requires real time practice and coaching and, and you know, question and answer, but you can get a lot just from the from static. So do you consider yourself a group facilitator? Is that one? I, of your... I love facilitating groups. Yes. Oh, that's back to the label thing. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. So it's changing it into am I a thing to what do I do? It's changing from a noun to a verb. So yeah. instead of what am I, it's what do I do, you know, and, and that's, and I definitely love working with groups. It's really, that's challenging. It, I've come very much, it's very invigorating. Yeah. You know? Well, I kind of see, um, I mean, my project is sort of figuring out how to facilitate in a healthy way bigger and bigger groups, mm -hmm. scaling it up to thousands, hundreds of thousands, mm -hmm. millions mm -hmm. of people. Right. Is that um, through Hive Mind? Right. Well, yeah, through the Hive right. One dot net. That's right. the platform I designed for it. And is that a concept? The concept of, that you're interested in facilitating mass groups of people in a different way for? I'm interested in a, in a in a, in a um, abstract sort of way because I've never. 
seen it done on that level, and I've definitely thought about it. I've thought, you know, uh, John Buck is the person who I learned sociocracy from, and he wrote the main book on dynamic governance, and it, in, that was the, one of the first books published uh, in English on the subject. And that's his goal. Actually, he thought Port Townsend might be his his next step, scale up to having an entire community, an entire town, or he'd love to find it. A, you know. A, a city or a town that would just go all in on organizing itself sociocratically. So that concept of, of lar ever larger organization and, and facilitation of groups that way is fascinating to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in your project and how, how that works, how that would work. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just sort of curious, um, like how big of a group do you feel like right now you would feel comfortable facilitating uh, with whatever tools you know that are available? Yeah, well, I guess the, the size of the group, so, you know, the Occupy groups were pretty big, and their difficulty was that not everybody was on the same page, not everybody had the same understanding of what was going on, and there was so much resistance to any sort of group coordination or anybody standing up front calling the shots, you know, that it was difficult to pull that together. But I think that if you have a group that is on the same page, that has gotten some training about the basis for consent decision making and the intention behind that and what they can expect from that and how to participate in that. I think you could pretty work with a, I mean, I don't know how to say how big of a group. I know that, that dynamic uh, sociocracy has been implemented in very large, uh, I don't know if, I don't know about entire, oh, Zappos. Zappos, I think, is running on sociocracy. Hmm. Um, and I uh, like the uh, the what was it the I can't remember now. It's, um, he lists a few uh, companies on the back of his book. I think it was like the European wing of Shell Oil, um, or maybe it was the Dutch element or something like that. Um, was running on dynamic governance and uh, a few others. Um, I wish I could think of them right now. I want to say Mars Candy mm. for some reason. <coughs> anyway, well, so they they they've implemented on some pretty large scales, but I don't know how to. Well, what. Um, and forgive me, I'm just sort of following a train of thought yeah. in my interrogating you as a someone that knows about facilitation. Yeah. Um, let's assume they don't have any training. I mean, and they don't have... I mean, you're starting from s square one with the group. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, though, they have to at least be saying, Alex, will you help facilitate us? Or, so that would be step... Or, or even... Or even or uh, another way to say it would be they have to at the very least, like let's say I let's say they don't say hey Alex or someone would someone do this, but let's say I jump up and say, actually I, at that meeting was a good example. It's a small scale, but on that at that meeting I'm pretty sure I didn't walk in there and say I know how to run this meeting. I'm going to show you how to do this. Right? Okay. So I'm ready to here hand out. You know, it was more like I can do this. You know, this is something I could do. And then I don't know if someone said, well, why don't you do that? Or if I said, why don't I do that unless someone object. So it's not so much you have to have people saying, I want you to do it. You have to have, you'd have to not have people saying, no, 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 I, no, we don't want that. Yeah. And so the objection part, as you know. Yeah. Um, so, so go ahead. So if okay. they wanted me to jump up, so, or if I'm, I'm at least I'm in front and there's a big group and they're, yeah. going, and they're not objecting. Yeah. So let's say it's a big, it's a group of uh, 200 people and it's a real mishmash of people, like mix of right, left wing, conservative, liberal, and um, they have to make a decision, or some decisions. Uh, 200 people, would you be comfortable saying, um, I can help facilitate this if there's no objection? Yeah. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, what if it was a thousand people? Well, uh, I, as if the logistics were in place to hear, you know, to, to, to do that, yeah. Well, no, what logistics? Just be able to hear people, for people to be able to see what's going on, for people to be able to, to somehow know that they have a way to have their voice heard in that in that process. If there's some sort of, I don't know if it's microphones or... Yeah, you know. I mean, you assume audio, assume everyone can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And see enough to know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, I might, like, uh, call you <laughs> to help do that. <laughs> yeah, Because right that is the goal, to get, you know thousand plus. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine we'd probably be on the phone a lot planning 
you know, what we were going <laughs> to, exactly how we would do it logistically. Yeah, yeah. In terms of logistics and stuff, definitely preparation and planning. But what's, what's exciting for me about working with groups is, uh, is, the, is the spontaneity. Is yeah. you, you don't know what you're going to encounter. And then the challenge of, of dealing with that in real time. Uh, in fact, I actually consider that to be maybe the most cutting edge of this whole thing is at the intersection of consent decision making and empathy for uh, differences that emerge or, or more likely conflict that emerges in, in some of that process. Uh, even if it's not conflict, it could be someone who's just totally distressed about something, what someone just said or what, you know, whatever is being proposed. Uh, and, and, you know, when you get triggered like that, you, you can't, it's hard to reason. You know, you don't have access to your thinking faculties the way you do under, when you're not triggered. So to try to reason with someone or talk to them in a normal, in our usual sort of way, who's super triggered is not going to be, is usually not very effective. So having this other skill of empathy, uh, which is, and, I, and actually I would call it empathy in action, mm -hmm. uh, not just the empathy that we think of, but this is, this, this is the very, very specific practice that I teach, uh, and I call it empathy in action. So having that piece in there would be absolutely essential to have some people in a large group who know how to do that piece? So, someone, ideally, someone other than me. Yeah, you know, someone else or someone, someone, so other, someone other than us. Sprinkled into, and so basically, you would need a, uh, you know, to as you scale up the number of people, you need to scale up sort of level of um, uh, helpers. Yeah. that have that skill. Um, right. In the in t for when these small conflicts. Right. Small. Right. Yeah. When you have a small, very small group, you you know, you need a facilitator, a scribe. And uh, maybe a stacker, yeah, or something like that. Um, but as you get bigger, you need more roles. You need a timekeeper, you need a vibe watcher, and yeah. you know, all those things that we saw emerge out of the yeah. 